Hi, if you're into blockchain or crypto, DeFi, NFTs, ICOs, STOs, TGs, any other of these letters really, or you're beginning to learn, or you've got lots of experience, this is the place to stick around. We hold these sessions every Sunday evening, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. UK time, and they're open to everybody, novices and experts alike. If you're still learning, then this is a great opportunity to pick up knowledge about how various things work or learn more about some of the buzzwords that you hear. If you're running a project, we do our Gone in 180 Seconds, which is where you get the opportunity to pitch your project or initiative and talk about what you're doing without slides, without websites, without additional things, just actually talking and then we can chat through and learn more about the initiative you're, you're involved in. Do remember to subscribe, to like, click on that little bell so that you get notified about other sessions in future. But most importantly, come along, they're open to all. Anyway, let's see what we're going to talk about this week. And Kavya. Hey, Kavya. Hi. Is it Gary? It is, yes. What, right. what, bring, what brings you along today then, Kavya? Oh, well, I, I wanted to actually have a more in-depth idea about the concept of blockchain, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, how the exchange works and things like that. So I'm not sure if this is an exact forum to ask such very basic questions, uh, but um, I it, it, it's, it, it, it's the perfect forum for that kind of thing. That's, a, that's the whole idea of these sessions. It's open to everybody who wants to ask beginner questions right the way through to much much more advanced stuff, so that, that's not a problem at all. Um, how much do you actually know about blockchains and crypto to begin with? So based on what I have read, um, I've got a very confused idea. So that's why I was like, you know, trying to get it uh, straightened out. So it's, it's more about um, like, I have the basic idea of what is blockchain or what is a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, but it's yeah. more on its uh, functioning. Um, that I'm not clear about. So, you know, um, how did it originate? How is it tracked? How is that okay. security maintained and things like that? Okay. So good, good opportunity is we, we, we've got Gabrielle on, but no, nobody else on. Gabrielle, can you hear us now? You, you know uh, she no, yeah, I think she's still uh, connecting uh, to the video. She's facing some connection challenge. Okay, now uh, she. Okay. Okay, no problem. Hello, Gary. Will you hear me, Cambia? Hey, we can hear. You. Oh, sorry, I don't know what happened with uh, with my microphone last last day. The same same thing. I don't know what happened, but no, not the end up here. <laughs> no, not not a problem. We can we can hear you now, which is the important thing. Um, it was in, in, interesting. Kavi was asking some really great basic questions to begin with, so um, might might be worth my my spending a few minutes describing things. Uh, okay. in, in terms of some of the basics, uh, and but be welcome your input as well, because I know you've been looking at this stuff for a while. So, Kavi, to begin with, um, a couple of terms and expressions. So, blockchain, to begin with. So, blockchain is a software protocol that runs on a group of computers, which, which are connected to each other in some way across a network. And the protocol ensures that the databases between them are kept in synchronization. And depending upon which blockchain it is, so there's several blockchains, you might have heard of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency with a blockchain, which is called the Bitcoin blockchain, funnily enough. There are other blockchains such as Ethereum, uh, Cardano, Dash. There's lots and lot, lots of them. And what many of them do is they have a cryptocurrency that's associated with them. Okay, so the Bitcoin blockchain has got a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. We okay so far? Uh, so I had questions. So I was like, uh, do I interrupt you then and there or? Yeah, go, go for it. Okay. Uh, ask, ask away. All right. So um, uh, you had mentioned like we have the different type of blockchains like the Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. So here, um, is it how the blockchain propagates? Is that protocol that is different or do they all basically use the same uh, protocol, but it is like from different uh, yeah. owned so, by so, people? So, so, so there's a mixture. First of all, um, you might have many protocols which are kind of copies of each other. So think of a protocol that's just software, right? Uh, and the software just runs across a network. So as an example... Um, there's the software protocol which Bitcoin uses, and people have taken copies of that, or it has been copied, and they do what's called hard fork, 
which is where they create their own version of the software. They make a few tweaks and changes to it, and they create their own networks. So that's why you've got things like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, uh, Bitcoin, um, i trying to think of some of the other ones, Toshi Vision. So BSV is the cryptocurrency for that. So you'll know that, or you might know that Bitcoin has got a symbol, which is BTC. Mm. So that is Bitcoin protocol running on a Bitcoin network with a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin, which is BTC. There's another one, which is Bitcoin Cash, which uses very similar software, just a few tweaks and changes in it, which has got a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin Cash, which is BCH. And then there's another one, which is Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, which is BSV. So there are various versions of of the Bitcoin blockchain protocol to begin with. Then there are different types of um, blockchains beyond Bitcoin. So another one is Ethereum. Ethereum uses a similar but different protocol, which which is the Ethereum protocol. There you go. They they keep things simple. Uh, But they work on similar lines. Okay. The next level beyond that is what's known as the consensus mechanism. So this is how do the databases all keep in synchronization with each other. So the mo- so I'll quickly just explain that, and it'll make sense. This is where you might hear of a thing called um, Bitcoin mining. It actually says blockchain mining, but we'll talk about Bitcoin mining, for example. This is where the, the consensus mechanism, this is the thing that keeps everything synchronized and agreed with each other, is a thing that's known as pro- proof of work. Mm-hmm. And this is where you might hear of blockchain miners or Bitcoin miners who are all running these high-powered computers uh, which solve a puzzle every 10 minutes, which is in a big competition across all of them. So that's how the Bitcoin protocol works. Ethereum used to use a similar thing called proof of work. It's moved to proof of stake. But in essence, different blockchains are or different pieces of software that behave similarly, uh, but have got variations in how they ensure that their networks are synchronized. Does that does that all make sense so far? Yeah. So a couple of things that I wanted clarification there is, I guess somebody else is also joining in. Feel free to mm-hmm. stop me if there is a agenda by which this goes. So right, carry carry on, carry on. We're all learning on this. <laughs> right. So um, one. Um, as you mentioned, the Bitcoin uh, protocol or an Ethereum protocol, it runs on their network, you said. Mm-hmm. So, um, like, are they like separate organizations that have their own network? Like, for example, let's say um, you have the different cloud providers like the Google Cloud, Azure, mm-hmm. and AWS. So, uh, you know, like their data centers or their machines, their clouds, their services, that's yeah. independent to them, although yeah. they are similar in nature. So is it something like that? Or- it, it, it can be. So some blockchain miners or some Bitcoin miners, for example, they might have complete computer rooms filled with these um, high-powered computers, all just running the Bitcoin protocol, okay, is Bitcoin mining. Or they might be mining operations that actually identify which cryptocurrencies are worth mining, and it will flip. So it'll go from Bitcoin mining one day to Ethereum mining to another, to to various things. So you can actually um, change them. And as I say, the Bitcoin protocol is simply software on a computer. So you could load the Bitcoin mining protocol on your computer and take part in that mining operation. Um, It's just that in all probability, your computer's not going to be powerful enough and you're never actually going to mine any crypto. So, yeah, the, the software can be loaded such that you can mine multiple cryptocurrencies um, or you can dedicate it to just running one. And this is where you get some people who might run like Bitcoin mining on, on dedicated computers or they might use, you mentioned before, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, um, Azure, or all these kind of things where you can potentially run mining operations on those as well. So, this all make this all making sense? Yeah. So taking one step back, the whole idea of why bitcoins or the cryptocurrency came into place, I understand it is to uh, replace the existing um, money that uh, you know form of currency that we have in the world in order to um, make it more transparent, um, avoid all the issues of. Uh, 
black market, black money, and uh, have a transparent form of uh, currency exchange in the world. Is that understanding right? So p- part of it, if you go back to what, one of the original uh, papers that's around this is, is the Bitcoin blockchain what, white, white paper that was written by, we don't actually know the real name of, of the author, but it's what's known as the Satan, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, paper. Satoshi Nakamoto is a pseudonym, so it's not a real individual. They've never actually worked out who it is. And it's a, a relatively short paper that explains the rationale behind Bitcoin and how it works. And fundamentally, uh, Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency was designed to develop a solution that provided a means to electronically transfer value without an intermediary. Uh, and that was it. So it was a peer-to-peer payment system. Okay. So the notion of, well, it stopped black markets and that is didn't appear in, in the paper, okay. um, and it, and it not, wouldn't necessarily. Uh, the, the notion of transparency d- doesn't actually apply in the paper either, but yeah. the, the, the ability to have a peer-to-peer, so person-to-person, mm. ability to make payments without an intermediary, so mm. without a bank, without a broker, was mm. absolutely fundamental, and also for it to be censorship resistant. And mm. by that, I mean the idea that you and I could continue transacting with each other yeah. without the ability of a third party preventing that. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's, in essence, the, the, the principle behind the Bitcoin protocol. Now, there have been other cryptocurrency protocols, uh, such as Dash and Monero. These are what are known as uh, privacy coins. And these are things that, again, they allow the peer-to-peer payments thing, and they do it in a way that they make it very, very difficult, if not impossible, to work out who is make it, who is involved in that transaction. So that, that's where privacy comes into it. That right. all, all makes sense as well? So I just yeah. want to say hi as well, J- joined by Jolly as well. So hi, hi, Jolly. Jolly's staying quiet, always trying to find the mute button. Hi, hi. hi nice yeah. to meet you guys. <laughs> Hey, we're just talking about the basics of blockchain and cryptocurrency at the moment. So a, a good a good primer if you don't know about it. But if you do, you can join in the conversation as well. Of course, of course. I'm working in this field as well. Excellent. Yeah, but I, I specifically to do um like a top, tokenomic design for those blockchain games. So I always keep eyes on the trend of the cryptocurrency and the market information. Yeah, Alpha project as well. Brilliant. Okay. Well, we'll we'll talk about the project in, in a little while if you would like. That that'd be really interesting. Um, it might be worthwhile. I, I was just going through with Caviar some basics around what a blockchain is and how it works. Mm-hmm. That 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 leads quite nicely into the next thing, Caviar, that you might ask which is, well, what's the difference between a cryptocurrency and what, um, what Jolly just mentioned there of a token, okay? So remember I said before about how the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, is a group of computers that are all running the same software to, to mine the cryptocurrency. You, re- you remember that? Okay. So what, what the software does is it sets a puzzle and it gets a set of transactions. So these are the, if this might be, you know, I've sent some Bitcoin to you, you've sent some Bitcoin to Peter who's just joined us and so on. That, that gets built up into what's called a block. So this right. is just a set of transactions. And every, every 10 minutes, the people who are miners on the network, their computers uh, have a competition to see who can solve a particular puzzle, which is what's known as a cryptographic hash of, of those tra- transactions. So it's all clever mathematics doing various calculations, and it comes up with a solution to the, the puzzle. Whoever solves that puzzle first and the others agree or sufficient of the others agree with it, they are rewarded in cryptocurrency. Okay, so in the Bitcoin case, when Bitcoin first started in 2009, 2010, um, every 10 minutes, whoever solved the puzzle was rewarded 50 Bitcoin. Then four years later, that was reduced to 25 then it was reduced to 12 and a half. Currently, it's six and a quarter. And in April of this year, it will reduce to 3.125. So every four years, the amount of crypto that a miner is rewarded is halved. And this is why you might hear the term the Bitcoin halving process. 
So every four years, the, the reward is hard. And that is how new cryptocurrency comes into existence. It's, it's mined every, every 10 minutes. So cryptocurrency is the native token related to a blockchain. So remember I said the Bitcoin blockchain has got a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. The Ethereum blockchain has got a cryptocurrency called Ethereum and so on. So they are what are known as native cryptocurrencies. With Ethereum from about 2014 onwards, there was a capability to actually uh, do programs on blockchain. So not just transfer value, but actually write little programs which are called smart contracts. And these allow tokens to be created, which basically say, if this happens, then do this. Mm -hmm. And they could transfer values in there. And that's where you've got the concept of what are known as crypto tokens. Mm -hmm. And this is where, particularly on the Ethereum blockchain, on the Cardano blockchain, and a few others, there are these programmable tokens. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to do all sorts of amazing things. So jo Jolly mentioned before about how they're doing tokenomics uh, on gaming. Mm -hmm. But you can do things like, it, it's kind of like having a Starbucks loyalty card, mm -hmm. whereby you can create tokens that pay people for doing things either like playing games um, or participating in activities and so on. Yeah. And then some people have then developed it further yeah. where you can create what are known as NFTs. Yeah. So these are non-fungible tokens. Yeah. So these are little tokens that represent uh, the ownership of things. So this is where you might see artwork, music, games again, uh, now coming into real estate, property, gold, all sorts, which are represented by these tokens. So these are what are known as crypto tokens. And then if those tokens relate to physical assets in some way, that's where you'll hear the term crypto assets. So you'll, you'll hear three things. You'll hear cryptocurrency, which is a native cryptocurrency. You'll hear crypto tokens, which is a programmable capability. And you'll hear crypto assets, which relates to an actual asset. And in different countries, those definitions kind of change a little bit, so it gets a bit blurry. Does that all make sense? Yeah, so if I just quickly summarize, mm -hmm. uh, the objective of having a blockchain-based uh, cryptocurrency was uh, to have a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of currency without a third party involved in it. Correct. But, uh, um, so I have a question there that, uh, because this is more like a soft currency, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like how is the value determined? Like in, in okay. a normal uh, uh, world, like you have like $1 is equal to this much euros or this much pounds. Yeah. If a translation happens where um, the different bodies, they kind of maintain or regulate uh, the currencies. So yep. in terms of the crypto world, how is that regulation happening? One. Second, okay. um, um, like you mentioned, like uh, um, although the original uh, objective of this was exchange of currencies uh, between peers, uh, now it's more like there are some uh, there is some uh, number of coins or currency thrown on uh, on the internet somewhere, and um, people uh, mine it by solving problems, and they uh, take it. So it's it's more like a treasure hunt kind of a thing rather than like a peer to peer exchange. Yeah. Okay. So, so let, let, let's take it in stages then. So first of all, you talked about um, the value of currency. Yeah. First of all, uh, the value of currency is not regulated, mm -hmm. uh, and by that I mean fiat currency. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, what you, but what you do have is you have exchanges which mm -hmm. are regulated exchanges. And mm -hmm. so if you want to buy US dollars, mm -hmm. then you have to go to an authorized place and mm -hmm. they actually buy and trade through all authorized exchanges. But the actual price of how much you know, a 10 pound note is worth in dollars mm -hmm. is a free market. Okay, it's, it's decided by the market. And that's why the, the pound to dollars goes up, down, sideways and everything. So that, that then leads on to a more fundamental question of, do you know why this £10 is mm. worth £10? Mm. That is what the uh, bank regulates based on the GDP of the country? No. Nope. Against yeah. the US dollar? No. No. Nope. no. It, it's worth £10 because enough other people believe it's worth £10. <laughs> and, and that's it. 
Okay, and it really is as simple as that. So this this doesn't represent years and years ago. You you had what was known as the gold standard, which was where it used to say on on British sterling, uh, promise to pay the bearer, and it actually related to holdings of gold in a in a bank deposit somewhere. That that got dropped many many years ago. The reason a ten pound note is worth ten pounds is because enough of the people believe it's worth ten pounds. And that belief and that perception is held up by governments, with police, with laws, with regulations, and with armies, ultimately, um, yeah. to, to support it. So the reason that Bitcoin is currently worth $42,000 or whatever is because there's a free market where enough other people are willing to pay $42,000 for it. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. So <laughs> I, I can see Peter getting a bit wound up there. Peter, do you want to join in on no, the conversation? No, <laughs> It was just something, and I had one in, to hand. Um, it's the fact that when it says one pound, it's what one pound means, and they don't know. This used oh. to be one pound. This used to be one pound. So I oh. promised to bet it's, what you've got is a note, and a note is a contract. It says a pound note. It's not a pound. It's a pound note. It's yep. an IOU, and it said, I promised to pay the bearer on demand the sum of one pound. One pound is 16 ounces. So a one pound was 16 ounces of sterling silver. And that's why you refer to our currency as pound sterling. Yep. One pound was this much silver. Now this much silver is nearly a thousand pounds. So that pound isn't worth a pound of silver anymore. It's <laughs> worth 1% of a pound of silver. Yeah. It, it is interesting, actually, if, if you look on a British pound, uh, well, this is a 10 pound note. And I think it still says up at the top, I promise to pay the bearer. You, yeah. you can actually take this to the Bank of England on Threadneedle Street you can hand it over, and you know what they'll give you in return for it? A new one? Another one, or uh, the equivalent value. So they might give you two five-pound notes or a load of one-pound coins or whatever. So the actual where it says, I promise to pay the bearer, it's basically replace it. Yeah. it it's, it's not actually fundamental. So, so this is the thing that cr cryptocurrency is worth what it is because enough people are willing to buy and sell it. And this is where th that is true of pretty much anything. You know, if you go into a shop and it's got like a Mars bar for 90 pence or something, it's only worth 90 pence because it's marked up as 90 pence and enough people are willing to pay that much for it. If nobody would buy Mars bars because they say they're too expensive, then Mars would lower the price and it would come down and it'd find a natural price. It's the same with currencies. So the US dollar at any point is worth a certain amount because people are looking at the general activity of e economics in the States, they're looking at the equivalent in the UK, and they're saying, well, at the moment, the dollar's worth you know, £1.23 or wh whatever it is type thing. So it's, it's, fr it's free market economics. Did, did that answer both of your questions, Kavir? Uh, partly. The only part that I was not able to understand is the part where, um, you know, uh, what is the incentive for people to want it like for example mm -hmm. the uh, how currency came into being is once upon a time anthropologically we had uh, a barter system where say uh, you know uh, you have a goat i have a sheep and you know for equivalent to one kilo of yep. your goat um, I, I i give you like uh, one kilo of my buffalo or whatever and you know th that was uh, the uh, means of how uh, uh, the uh, what to say, uh, transactions used to happen. And yep. when different people had different things, like one guy has meat, another guy has uh, vegetables, another guy has something else, then it, it was again difficult to uh, have that kind of um, uh, a, a common uh, yep. regulation where it says that, okay, for one kilo of goat, you get 10 kilos of potatoes. Yep. So that is how the currency came into place where you can say, okay, you know, you assign amount and assign a gradation of values to it based on mm -hmm. which you can uh, do trading. Yep. So uh, what so, is so, cryptocurrency, uh, uh, you know, like uh, you said that it is because people believe in it, but uh, what is their incentive in moving from, um, you know, um, this to this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so you're right. First of all, that the purpose of money in this kind of form is to fill what's known as the double coincidence of needs, which is I, I need a carrot 
mm. or a, a pan of carrots and you mm. have a need for some timber to build a house mm. but we can't exchange carrots for timber so what, what we need to do is come up with a, 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 an intermediary mm. that allows an exchange in some way and you know if you're selling a, a, a cow and I don't want a whole cow, you know, you can't exactly slice a bit of it off type thing. So you're absolutely right. Okay. So the, the, the reason that cryptocurrency is attractive to people is because of two reasons from, from my perspective, certainly. Uh, one is it cuts out the middleman. And whenever you have middlemen in any transaction, it always introduces friction and cost. So if you think about um, if you're repatriating money to another country, and you go via, you know, PayPal um, or any of the um, payment providers or banks, for that matter. You'll normally pay a fee, yeah. and it'll be a, it'll be a hidden fee because they'll do it in the transaction transfer. Yeah. So if you convert from pounds to dollars, they'll make a margin in some way. So first of all, by using crypto, you're removing the intermediary. You are dealing di directly. So that's one reason. And then the other reason is if you saw what happened in Canada, for example, about two years ago, where there were a group of Canadian truckers who were protesting against lockdowns, um, and the Canadian government instructed the Canadian banks to freeze their bank accounts. Okay, Now, the Canadian truckers at the time weren't doing anything illegal. They've got a right to protest in that. But suddenly, they lost access to the ability to make payments and receive payments. Mm. So this is the censorship resistant piece. So that, that, that's the, the second major thing where crypto is attractive. So for me, the, the two main areas, and, and there are others for other people as well, is certainly uh, censorship resistance um, and the fact it reduces the intermediary. So the, there's a couple of things. I just wanted to invite in, we've got a few more people who've joined us. See, um, Chris has joined us and uh, James as well. If anyone wants to join in on this conversation, any other thoughts about what makes cryptocurrency attractive, now, now's a great chance. So can, can I add to that, Gary? When you when um, um, you're just saying there about they want you to change a cow for a house and use money, you didn't. You use gold or silver or copper. Mm -hmm. You use commodities. You used a, a, a transportable means. And yep. the currency that we have, pounds, shillings, and pence, LSD, was gold, silver, and copper. And you had gold, coins, silver, coins, copper. The notes came in so that you didn't have to carry big weights of gold and silver. But you used yep. to, you should have had the you should have had that commodity in the bank. Mm -hmm. And then you discovered people didn't have the commodity in the bank sometimes. And then you trust the government for it, but we don't trust the government now, a lot of us. And especially we don't trust the banks. So there's the trust bit you've got. But yep. the other part is the transport. If I want to take my money out of this country because I don't like the government. They're going to restrict me on what I can take out. Even going to the bank now, if I've asked for £10,000 of my own money out, the bank's going to ask what I want it for. And if I say put it in crypto, they won't give it to me. Mm. So now I don't trust the government. I don't trust the banks. And if I want to move around and travel globally, I don't want them to pin me down to what I can transport. Yep. Whereas if it's in the cloud, well, I need my password. Yep. So that's, and you might say, Gary, when blockchain, when Bitcoin came around, it was two. It was the two thousand eight crash. Yep. When they were printing money and devaluing money, that was the origin of it. It's people didn't trust mo fiat money anymore. It, it's I think, a, it's, uh, I, I think. Well, you're absolutely right. In fact, one of the first was it the first uh, Bitcoin blockchain signatures in there uh, was actually a headline from the Times about the global financial crash. So it was clear that Bitcoin was the kind of thing that Caviar was going to say that the other thing as well um, was I've lost my train of thought. I was, I was about to introduce another thing there that was quite important. Uh, oh, yes, banks. This is the other thing is that people um, are trusting banks less and less. And I, and I get this. I, I go to conferences and I, I was on a panel a few months ago and I, I said to the audience, how many of you I've got your money in a bank. And lo loads of hands went up. I said, okay, none of you have. Can you imagine? I, Sorry? I, I want to uh, like share a story of mine to tell yeah. you how I'm oh. trying to the but bank. 
Do you want to finish that off, Gary? Because you're yeah, going to say it's not yeah. your money anymore, it's the bank's. Yeah, do, yeah. Jolly, the, 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 definitely. Let, let me just quickly share this story because it, it, it further emphasizes Caviar's point as well. Oh, mm. oh the points of Caviar. Okay, so I was at a conference and I said to people, how many of you have got your money in the bank accounts? And loads of hands went up and I said, none of you have. When you put money, your money, into a bank account, it ceases to be your money. It's legally a loan to the bank. And there's a subtle difference there. It means that the bank is not acting um, as a custodian. They are now a creditor. Oh, sorry, you are now a creditor. And that's why it is that in the UK, there's a thing called the FSCS, which is the Financial Services Com Compensation Scheme, which compensates you in the event of a bank going under. Okay, so this is the thing that where people put money into a bank account and they think it's their money. It isn't. It ceases to be theirs. So this is an, another thing of crypto. Sorry, jo Jolly, you were about to share something. Yeah, <laughs> it's a funny story. And it's not, it's unsolved issue as well. A few days ago, I made some transactions from my Barclay Bank account to um, MetaMask. Mm -hmm. So I withdraw some money and I put some money into the uh, bank, into the app, uh, wallet. And uh, <laughs> after almost the seven transactions, Barclay, they closed my bank account. <laughs> With, because of these transactions. And yep. now I have to explain and I and I have to offer a lot of evidence to show them I'm working in this sector and I'm an official professional in this sector. That is my income, where my income come and where my salary come. Yep. They still don't give me my money back until today. Wow. This is what I'm saying the bank is, is, is lo it has already lost their trust from us, I would say. Mm -hmm. You're, you're absolutely right. And it's something against caviar. People are beginning to wake up to this. And this is, and this is why it is, um, the, this is why it is that the police will not get involved if the bank refuse to give you your money because it's not your money. They, they say this is a financial transaction uh, and you are a creditor, therefore, you know, the bank haven't stolen it. Um, I mean, there, there is... The, the points, you know, Caviar mentioned something privately about with the, the truckers, that if they had crypto coins, it wouldn't be necessarily accepted, which is, which is fair. But this is where there is a growing kind of interest in this space about either people and companies accepting crypto for payments, and that can be troublesome because, as jo Jolly mentioned, particularly in the UK at the moment, actually getting your bank to allow you to either convert crypto to uh, pounds or pounds to crypto, they're quite obstructive. You know, they, 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 every time I try to do it, they always flag it as a, a, a potentially fraudulent transaction. And so the whole idea of crypto is to encourage people and organizations to trade directly in crypto. And that stops the, the, this whole problem because the banks can't prevent you um, transacting di directly. Now, in the case of Bitcoin and the main cryptos, there are now intermediaries, and this, this is the sad thing, it goes back to the, you know, the idea of Bitcoin was that it gets rid of intermediaries, who will act as a kind of an, an intermediary. And so you can pay for things using crypto as the payment rail, but then it instantly gets converted into pounds. And you also get things like uh, Revolut, so Re Revolut, um, you can now buy and sell what, what's known as exposure to crypto. So you don't actually own the crypto, but it allows you to pay for things in, in crypto and this kind of thing. So th there are ways and means around it. But at the moment in the UK, uh, the government on the face of it is being hugely supportive of crypto because it sees this great potential, but doesn't seem to be mandating that the regulators or the banks support it. Which, which means you've got the you know, politicians on one hand saying, oh, we love crypto, it's innovative, we really support it. But the reality is it, it's actually really difficult to do it. So uh, ho hopefully that answered Peter. Is that because we think the central banks are going to roll out uh, 
central bank digital currency to us perhaps so they can't say it's a bad thing because they're mm-hmm. going to effectively mandate it maybe from this year if not next for sure so yep. they can't say they're against it and the bank won't say nat west won't say to me you can't they just said restrictions etc and after two hours on the phone and speaking to my personal banking manager no we don't allow crypto exchange in or yep. out yep. so as you say i go through revolut and i've got a card a ledger card a number of cards actually coinbase card and my crypto is on that, and I can just spend it directly. And if you say it just as a conversion, at point of sale. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's how to get money in and out is how they're stifling the retail sector. Kavya's raised a, a really interesting point that she, she's put in the chat, I think. Uh, and it's, it's worth sharing this openly because for people who are into crypto, th- this is even more of a, a, a thing of explaining how these things. She says, in the case of money, there's a regulatory body in every country that prints money and associate a value to it based on the GDP, inflation rates, et cetera. No, there isn't. No. There is, in the UK, there is the Bank of England, and the Bank of England is responsible for printing banknotes, but when it issues the banknotes, it has no control over the value of them. The, the value of a banknote is determined by what people are willing to pay for them, okay? So there is no regulation over the price. There is regulation over the release, Okay. And in actual fact, mo- most money is not created by printing money. It's created by what's known as fractional reserving, which is when you put your money into a bank account and it's now held on deposit, and that's now that uh, the bank is now a creditor, the bank effectively resells that loan that they have, they, they resell it to other people and they resell it and resell it. So this is where if you take out a mortgage, for example, um, they effectively create money out of thin air. It's got nothing to do with the Bank of England creating it. So banks are allowed to lend out multiples of how much money they have on deposit. So that the notion that printing of currency has got any connection with the value of the currency is actually quite loose. Although if they print loads and loads and loads of it, the value of it de- decreases because obviously the more of it there is, the, le- the less of it it's worth, which is why we don't use leaves on a tree, for example, because there's loads of leaves and the, the value of it, it would drop down. So the thing where you're saying about how crypto coins regulated, um, in terms of the price, it's total free market. So there are multiple exchanges. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, you can go on to... You know, Kraken, Binance, Crypto.com, all, all these websites, and you can buy and sell crypto, whatever people are willing to sell it to you for. So it, it's totally open there. So there's, there's no regulation on the price of cryptocurrency, nor is there any regulation on fiat currencies. These are government-backed currencies. So it's more like... Uh, I just uh, wanted to add, add or compliment, add something to what you said, or maybe correct it partially. Um, what's what's interesting about the borrower lender relationship, I think, is largely misunderstood, is that when you go to borrow money, um, when you put your signature on a piece of paper, you have effectively created the money. Yep. Yeah. So, in, in essence, to a to a large extent, when someone hands you a bunch of banknotes, so w- what's interesting about this is that it's different. Um, in the way it used to work versus the way it actually works now because we used to have real money. So if someone gave you gold and you gave them a piece of paper, they had given you a real asset. And so that's that signature meant that you owed them back. But now that what they give you isn't real money, they actually give you debt, right? If a a central bank note is is uh, the central bank's liability. It's it's a liability. So effectively, when you sign for a mortgage, you you shouldn't you don't actually owe them anything. They give no. you these banknotes, and you gave them a signature in exchange for those banknotes, and that transaction is complete. And yet, nobody really understands that, and the. The banks, of course, work on on the ignorance of the of the counterparty, so that on top of uh, your signature, they get to have you return the notes, right? But they're but 
but it makes no sense because it's it's not real money. It's actually a, a, an obligation. And so this is actually how money is created. It's not really by the banks. It's not it's not actually by the fractional the reserve system. It's merely by the fact that someone writes on a piece of paper, I owe, and they take that as an asset and they bloody sell it as an asset. Yeah. So it's a, a really good point. And then Caviar asks as well, who's the issue of that limits the number of coins in circulation? So in Bitcoin's case, I, I mentioned Bitcoin is a software protocol, so a piece of software. Within that software, it actually has um, a hard limit of 21 million Bitcoins, ultimately, is the most that will ever be generated. And this is why, again, the software protocol within it every four years halves the number of Bitcoins that are released every 10 minutes when each, uh, when each block is mined. So if you actually draw this out, you'll see that Bitcoins will cease to be produced through mining in 2140, which is over 100 years ago, uh, uh, over 100 years away, so we don't need to worry about it yet. So in, in Bitcoin's case, the, the limitation on the number of coins is controlled by the software. Not all... Uh, cryptocurrencies operate that way. So Ethereum, which is another cryptocurrency, does not have th this limit on it. Um, that, that, that just limits it in, in different ways that, that I, I'm not familiar with. So ultimately, limits on the number of coins that are issued, the rate at which they're issued and so on, is typically controlled by the software that runs on that blockchain's uh, network. But, so, uh, 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 the part of the question is like um, now there are Bitcoin uh, coins, Bitcoins that are there uh, on, you know. So uh, what if like I hack into that or I kind of duplicate it and I generate my own coins? So you can't. It, it, this is a sure thing. You, you could um, you could create your own hard fork, which is where you copy the software and you create your equivalent. So it'd be the uh, the blockchain, uh, so it'd be the Bitcoin caviar coin. Well, that's not BTC, that's your own coin. So everyone would recognize that and it would have whatever value people are determined on that. The thing with uh, cryptocurrencies also is that they're not actually physically held on your wallet or uh, at home or anything. They're simply entries in a ledger. So they're entries in the, the database which is what's shared out with everybody. And so access to that is through what's known as a cryptocurrency wallet, which has a key. So, so think of the way a blockchain works. It's almost like um, safety deposit boxes where you're allowed to know the number to put money into those safety deposit boxes, but only the owner has the key to actually take stuff out again. Okay? So, so it's, a, a, it's a highly secure way. Go on. Um, so that is where I have this question. I mean, I'm quite skeptical about man-made things. Mm -hmm. So um, assuming that all of you are from the software background itself, the fundamental uh, security of our um, applications are based on hard problems. That mm -hmm. uh, it is either irreversible in nature, like the keys or the things that we talk about. It's It's based on that hard problem that it is... Uh, computationally challenging to uh, uh, what is it, decipher it or uh, yep. decrypt it. But uh, today with cloud computing and you know HPC systems that are available uh, where we can actually scale, um, I'm beginning to question, are hard problems really hard today? So, certainly there's going to be a situation where the current cryptographic, the current cryptographic methods of security securing crypto transactions will be broken by the likes of quantum computing. However, quantum, it really depends who you speak to as to just how far developed we are down the line of quantum at the moment. We're probably not as far down that road as the marketeers would claim. However, either way, there are techniques of developing what are known as quantum resistance solutions. So cr cryptography, Cryptography is ultimately the mathematics of keeping secrets, okay? So it's, it's actually a pretty pure subject, and it, it's, it's provable that it, it works as well. But one day you might get a quantum capability that can hack into a cryptographic calculation. However, when we reach that point, 
There are many other things that are cryptographically secured. So mobile phone signals, uh, bank transactions, uh, nuclear codes for um, weapons, that kind of thing. The, these are all bank cryptographically accounts. secured. <laughs> bank accounts, yeah. And, and so crypto as a total marketplace is worth, I think it's $1.6 trillion at the moment. It may have gone down a little bit, which actually is tiny. You know, that, that's probably a, a day's worth of real world transactions, in fact, probably less. And so when the likes of quantum computing comes along to break cryptography, it's not going to be used to break blockchains and crypto because it's tiny compared to the opportunity of breaking into bank accounts and that kind of thing. But you, you're right, ultimately, if it's designed by humans, uh, humans are good at making mistakes and making errors. And this is why uh, a lot of the blockchain protocols are open source. So that actually allows people to inspect um, and be critical of the code and test it and, and check how it works and so on. So, Caviar, ho hopefully that's, that's given some thought and answered some of the questions. But yeah. I, ju I, just, I just wanted to open it up because I'm conscious we've got an, a number of people who sure. have joined in. Um, J James, I noticed you joined before, um, and also Harry as well. Er Eric joined us from the States. I don't know if anyone's got any other questions about any other subjects or any topics or anything else to add. I'll give a moment to start there, Gary. Gary just um, in terms of all the background, I mean, there's other books as well, but this is Jim Rickard's Currency yep. Wars. goes back and where money came from, uh, what happened in 2008, the currency wars, and what's happening now with crypto. I think you might know something about the BRICS we've talked about before, but we think yep. they're going to do an asset-backed crypto. So they're going to move away from the petrodollar, which is a bridge currency, and move to an asset-backed crypto, back to like gold-pegged fiat currency. And as Eric said, yeah, we, we refer to money, not as money. It's not money. It's, it's debt-backed fiat. Yeah. And, and Caviar, you, you're right on that piece. Caviar, the other thing I'd recommend is there are a couple of good videos on YouTube called The Money Masters, as well as Jim Ricard's book. Uh, yeah. That's definitely a good one. But you check out The Money Masters, and it's, okay. about, it's, it's about a three-hour film, I think. It's a documentary from a long time ago where it actually explains how the U.S. Federal Reserve came into being, how money <laughs> is created, um, how it's not at all what you think it is. And the, the, the thing I've loved about learning about crypto is it actually forced me to learn about real-world money as well. Uh, and I'm still learning and developing. And, you know, rightly, Eric corrected me on some stuff earlier on. It, it's, you find that actually when you get into crypto, you end up going down the rabbit warren of discovery of actually about real world money, which is fascinating. So, yeah. Interesting. I'll take a look. Yeah, d definitely work. But yeah, any, anything by Jim Rickards is good. Um, so Currency Wars is a great one. Um, and yeah, the, the money masters in the, in the crypto group that I used to run locally, I used to make that mandatory watching for everybody because it, it, it teaches you so much about what you didn't realize, how money really works. So but back, back to everyone again. Uh, Chris, Chris has joined us. Happy New Year. We, we have spoken since uh, last year, I think. How is it going? It's, going? it's going great. Sorry, a little bit of background noise. My son's here. But um, yeah, it's going well. Um, I missed the, the ERC4337, I think. We didn't uh, talk about it in the end. <laughs> oh, okay. The count extraction. No, sorry. Um, I was I was going to prepare for that one, and um, I think uh, I got into the festive spirit. So, um, no, I think, it was, I think it was Christmas Eve, wasn't it? So, um, but yeah, I'm doing well. Um, it's going to be a busy year this year for me. Uh, just working on um, a tokenized asset for somebody in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So, so he's got a great business, and um, so we're kind of. I'm working with a couple of guys from Dubai on that. And um, also just look into, because I work in the startup space, um, if people don't know. Um, so I'm working with startups, trying to get them to to educate on Web3 and um, understand how they can innovate within, that, within this space. And um, so I, I, I was looking to, to work with a quite a well-known um, blockchain incubator as well um, to bring them to a new um, to the Middle East, but I don't think that's going to happen straight away. 
So um, that's what I've been doing. But this year, um, looking to to really branch out and and uh, create a my consultancy in Web three. So that's what I'm I'm looking to do, just to help small uh, businesses, medium sized businesses, and maybe do a big one, uh, maybe to to educate and to start thinking about how they can um, really take advantage of this real shift in wealth when it comes to to Web three. And um, and what it, what it really means. Excellent. That's good to hear. Yeah. So so that my tie in with that, Jolly, you joined us earlier on, and you said you were working on uh, the tokenomics around a project. Yeah. Are you able to share a little bit more about what you're working on? Okay. <laughs> Actually, personally, I'm now based in London, and mm-hmm. the company I'm working for is based in Singapore. So mm-hmm. we specifically focus on um game blockchain games like okay. in Web three there are blockchain games they utilize the uh, blockchain technology into their um, tokens so we help those um uh, we help those uh, game com- companies to uh, build their tokenomic design and help them to do the operational improvement and also marketing scene as well. How to ma- manage their um, crypto assets as well to make sure these NFTs or tokens when they launched to the to the to the players, it it can keep it by a stable price or keep it uh, gradually increase by make sure this is based on the. A good enough tokenomic design. If the tokenomic didn't build well, it can be going to a death spiral. So this is what we are doing. And sometimes we help these companies to and do some investment consulting as well, help them to connect with those venture capitals. Yeah, mm-hmm. but most of the companies that are based in Asian areas, Chinese speaking areas, so some of them uh, uh, are uh, like looking for opportunities to uh, promote to Western countries, to mm-hmm. European countries, uh, United States, and some some projects they located in Europe, like Poland, uh, Ukraine and uh, even France, Germany, some of them are based in um, less, like uh, Seattle, uh, Los, An- Los Angeles, and New York City. They want more and more pleasures based in China. Could, uh, could also um, on board to their games. Mm-hmm. So they, they can do uh, promotions through us. We help them doing this kind of uh, promotion as well. Yeah, it's uh, really interesting then because Singapore has got a, a financial regulator, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, yeah. that has, has been very proactive and supportive around crypto as well. Yes, um, and it, it's done some stuff in collaboration with it in the UK. There's the FCA, which was mentioned before, but mm. the Monetary Authority of Singapore it seems quite active in that space. And you, you write around the gaming space, and this is where you start getting this this crossover across many industries that not only have you got the the crypto industry, the gaming industry, but you mentioned China, which uh, is where there's a lot of crypto mining that happens still, but also that there's a natural tendency culturally, I hope I'm not kind of like compartmentalizing, uh, Chinese tend to be quite enthusiastic about gambling as well. And and, And there's a lot of initiatives around crypto, gaming, gambling, regulating it, and that kind of thing, which is where Singapore uh, yeah. and Mal- Malta and Gibraltar are, are, are other regulators that are quite active in that crossover between gaming, gambling, and crypto. So yeah. I, I, I think you're in a great place on that. Yeah, but- so in Bangladesh of China, it's totally um, quite strictly regulated by this kind of thing. So that's why the company, even though they are doing project, uh, which is Chinese speaking, but mm-hmm. most of them based in Singapore. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But still the pleasures on board, they are Chinese speaking uh, pleasures like Malaysia, Singapore, mainland of China, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan. Those people, it's just because of the regulation now, it's not that loose yet. It's not that welcome yet. 
but it doesn't mean those pleasures, like the, the, those pleasures, they still are, are, are very, um, let's say, attractive to this kind of um, engagement because they know they can play to earn. They can earn money by playing this kind of game on board this kind of uh, activity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry to jump in there. Sorry, I know we ain't got much time, but I'm also a co founder of a uh, Web3 blockchain oh. gaming company. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're just going through, about to go through a seed round of wow. VC. Uh, it's a platform mm -hmm. um, that we're, we're looking to onboard of the indie games as well as play to earn or play to own type um, initiatives on our platform. So it'd be great to talk to you, Jolly. Yeah. What, what is the name of the company? It's called 8 Bit Arcade. A bit arcade. Okay. <laughs> <Retro>. <laughs> yeah, the, the CEO is very uh, old school. Um, because, gamer. okay, because yeah. if, why I ask this? Because uh, in the UK, I know there's a company which doing similar thing of yours. It's a platform crowded with different play uh, games on the on the platform. The name of the company is Tribally. I don't know if you heard about it. Tribally, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a couple. Um, I, I'm not too familiar with Tribally. Oh, no worries. We can, yeah, you two should connect off, offline, definitely. That, this is a great thing, and you know, I always encourage you yeah. do, do, yeah. do, do, re, do reach out to each other. Yeah, um, I mean, how can we do that? Can we do put a LinkedIn or uh, you find me from LinkedIn? I can drop you my number, my name. Yeah, sure. If anyone wants to put their LinkedIn profile in the chat before we oh, close yeah. the call, just yeah. do that. Could, yeah. that yeah. I will it, put my uh, LinkedIn link here. Yeah. Because that's why Jolie will explain to Christopher why it should be called 7-bit and not 8-bit because, <laughs> because, because, because of the significance of the number 7 in the, that kind of culture, yeah. if I remember correctly. 888 <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 is a very unlucky number for Chinese. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It means like you get a lot of fortune. <laughs> yeah. So seven, 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 seven is better. But then, but uh, but then Peter and I'll know the difference between seven bit and eight bit is the checksum. <laughs> but that's yeah. that's that's going back a few years, right? Sorry. Um, con conscious, we're, we're we're kind of really tight on time as we mentioned there. So thank you, Jolie, for for sharing that. It's really really good. And Chris for uh, your background as well, and uh, Eric was—he uh, shared his LinkedIn profile in there. Uh, Joel, you you mentioning about things like um, Los Angeles and that. Um, I think Eric is still out in LA, uh, and so is uh, another great guy who's got his own projects uh, as well, sort of stuff going on, um, which we probably haven't got time for him to share. But Eric, give it give it a name check. Vox is that right? V sorry, Val. No, yeah, yeah. we are. Um... We are kind of a redefinition of money. In some ways, it's um, it, it is taking the incorrect direction for money to go in, and extending it to ultimately turn it back into real money. So we're we're using the the um, discount mechanisms to essentially inflate fiat into into destruction and leaving behind a, a real asset like Bitcoin, which is called Val. So, yes. yeah. uh, um, and, and Eric has actually shared with us previously that the, the kind of like much, much more detail because it's a fascinating area about a whole new, um, I'd describe it as a whole new economic system, really, in, in some ways. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get Eric back on at some point when we've got more time to actually revisit that and get, go through it again. Because I'm, I'm just conscious we, we've got a number of people who've joined us who uh, are leaving as well. James didn't get a chance to in, get you introduced or say hi or anything. Are you still listening there, James? He's still not coming off mute, so I'll guess not on that. Uh, a, a couple of the others left. Um, we're pretty much on time, I'm afraid. It's, it's nearly on the hour. Uh, so hopefully Caviar uh, found some interesting things about some basics about you know what blockchain is and what cryptocurrency is and how it comes into me. Being and also, you find quite often with these kind of things, you end up learning more about real world money than you do about crypto. 
um, okay. it, it, it's quite an eye opener. So, Kavya, I hope you found that of interest. Yes, quite interesting. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for sh sharing the knowledge as well. We'll, we'll close off at that point then, and I'll say, th you know, thank you everyone for joining. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, do meet again. Do share your details in the link before we close the session off. Um, we meet every Sunday evening, so do come along and join us, novice expert alike. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your time. Have a great day.